Hi, everybody. What a joy. What a joy to be in Mound City again and uh, be with you folks. Not every, not, not a whole lot has changed. It, so somehow the, it's brighter out there. The light reflects off a of white hair more than... Uh, <laughs> Well, I'm telling you, you don't make a person feel very welcome. I come here to preach, and right on the back of the bulletin, it says, if you know of someone who'd be a great guest speaker, please contact an elder. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's been six years since I preached here, and that's a long time I thought you folks had forgotten about me. And I'm glad, mighty glad, to be back here again. Peggy is with me. We've changed, you know. Oh, there's my pen, Peggy. I couldn't find it, but I found it. Okay. Uh, we changed, too. And Peggy's been through a lot with pain and, and her foot. Uh, she came with me today. But when she doesn't come with me, the pain in her neck doesn't bother her anymore. So... <laughs> And, uh, and I myself, last Valentine's Day, was very ill, and they told me if it another few hours and I'd have been dead, and, uh, but I'm alive and here, and glad of it. Uh, I've got something special for you folks here at Mound City. It's this. This is a book that was just... <laughs> printed like days ago. We got it. It's titled God at Work Through Deaf Missions by Dwayne King. That's me. And uh, it's got a hundred and uh, hundred and fifty pages and there's almost that many pictures. So Russ could understand it and uh, uh, we uh, and here, it says Fellowship Christian Church. This is your book, a gift to you. You've earned it by being a friend of Deaf Missions. More than that, though, we want you to have it so that you may join us in praising God for His work through Deaf Missions. And then there's a thanks to the people who don't want recognition for paying for it, but they paid for this book. And uh, I don't know who to award it to, uh, is there a, uh, I'd like to award it to your preacher, but that's me today, so I'm going, your closest, come up here, Virgil, and uh, we'll give it to you. Now, during the sermon, you're not supposed to look at the pictures, okay? All right. That's hard for him. That's hard. Here's a list of the sermons that I've preached at this place through, uh, well, the first time, 1986, August 24th. There were 80 people here that day. And uh, it lists through uh, six revival meetings. And it's every one of those was just great, in my opinion. And you folks helped make it that way. Well, enough of that kind of stuff. Uh, I just today want to bring a message that has to do with staying with it. Staying with it. First and Second Peter are two of the most interesting books of the Bible. And I'm going to read from chapter 1 of First Peter verses 3 through 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that a great way to start a message? Wow. <clears throat> In His great mercy, by the way, some of you were, I, I started reading too quickly. It's First Peter, chapter 1, beginning with verse 3, and I'm going to start over. 
Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who, through faith, are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter, as you know, was a Jew. He fished for fish by trade until Jesus called him to fish for men. Fishing in those days, as I understand it, was for a man's man. Uh, the fishermen didn't just go like my dad and sit on the edge of the river on a sandbar in a folding chair and toss out a line. My dad was a big guy, but that's the way he fished. Peter was probably rugged and strong so that he could throw out those nets and pull them back in full of fish. He probably didn't have a lot of education, but he could write, we know, because he wrote first and second Peter. He was famous for his impetuous nature, for speaking his mind before he thought clearly. A lot of us are famous for that. And for denying Jesus at the time of his crucifixion. But he's also famous for his leadership, for his carrying the gospel to Gentiles, that's us. I'm getting to the place as I keep reading the Bible again and again where I marvel that we were not included. And then I marvel that, praise the Lord, we are included. And Peter's noted for his great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is noted for his sermon on the day of Pentecost. And he's noted for these two books, 1st and 2nd Peter. And the people that Peter was writing to were Christians. Peter wrote the first book to encourage the Christians to be faithful to Jesus. That's what I want today. Encourage you to be faithful to Jesus. Even though they were scattered and persecuted... Now, the second book is about scoffers and false teachers. Both books contain a little more information than all of that. For instance, 2 Peter talks about the end of the universe. And I find that to be quite interesting. But it's a, th these are good books. Peter was an interesting man. And uh, he wrote some interesting literature here. Now, I'm going to... Look, uh, I wonder if you noticed how long the sentence was that I read a while ago. That sentence that started in the middle of verse 3 and continued through verse 4 and continued through verse 5. I'm going to read that sentence again because I, I call that sentence the gospel message in one sentence. <laughs> That's essentially what that is. It speaks of God's mercy. It speaks of new birth, a living hope, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Christian's inheritance, eternity, heaven, and faith, and God's power, and you, and salvation, and the last days. That's all in one sentence. I'll read it again. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who, through faith, are shielded by God's power 
until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. <laughs> that is a sentence. Material enough for a month of preaching or more. And those folks needed that. Those folks were suffering. They were scattered. They needed that encouragement. And we need it today. You see, the, we do have an advantage, though. We have this book, the Bible. And this one is pretty thick because it's two of them, two uh, put together here, two translations. But we have this book. We can go to it. They didn't have the book. The letter that Peter wrote to them would become a part of the book. And they apparently had a letter from Paul, but they didn't have the Bible as we have it today. And they did have the Holy Spirit, which we also have. And he is strong and faithful and good. But being scattered and persecuted, they needed encouragement. Now we are not so scattered. Here we are. And we can encourage each other. You know, it doesn't matter how many, a few or a lot, we do need each other. <laughs> I remember telling my doctor one time, I said to him, Doc, did you know that every time I preach, I preach to between two and 3,000 people? He was impressed. And he said, really? I said, yeah. Well, he, he thought I must be a good preacher. And so and I left and I told him, this, this gal out front, I said, ma'am, did you know that every time I preach, I preach to between two and 3,000 people? She said, really? I said, yeah. And I, and I preach about every week. Wow. I said, do you know what I said? And she said, well, I thought you said you preached between two and 3,000 people. And I said, I do. Between two and 3,000 people every time <laughs> I preach. <laughs> and she says, oh. And uh, she didn't know I'd been preaching at Isadora. Uh, and uh, uh, I told her, I says, you know what? You better tell the doctor. Uh, and I don't know if she ever did or not, but uh, that's it. But we need each other where it's two or 3,000. We need each other. And then notice verses 6 and 7. And in a nutshell, those two verses make clear why they were suffering so much. So here is the answer to one of the whys that we Christians have. We wonder why bad people are blessed when good people are distressed. Why am I sick and someone else is not sick? Why do great Christians die young? Why, why, why? Why are, uh, we are very good and we are very persistent at asking why? Well, here is the answer to one of the most asked why questions. The question, why do Christians endure suffering? Read verses 6 and 7 with me. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, your faith may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. There, my friend, is the answer to one of the whys for them. Why must Christians endure suffering? In their case, at least, it was so that their faith may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. This may not be the whole answer to suffering, 
but it is a significant part of the answer. And certainly those dispersed Christians needed to know this answer. And I'm sure that they could become greatly discouraged with suffering and loneliness. I would. I know. All they had to do was to deny Jesus and life would be a lot better for them. But Peter explains that they should hold on to the faith. Friends, our time is coming. In fact, our time for suffering has arrived. And more than that, for many Christians, maybe some of you, the suffering has been going ongoing for a while. I'm not sure you've been locked up for your faith in Jesus. That may come. And obviously, none of you have been killed for Jesus' sake. Not yet, at least. But maybe you have been ridiculed or cut off from a grant for education or told you are worthless or made to sit alone at a coffee table while others joined in laughter at your expense. Or maybe you were teased because you would not participate in an activity that dishonored Jesus. Or you were cut off from others in your family. Already prayer in school, as you know, has been eliminated. The Christian flag has been tramped upon and burned. Christian gatherings in public buildings have been forbidden. Students who would enter Christian ministry are refused loans and grants. The Ten Commandments have been removed from courthouses and other public places. Setting up a nativity is challenged and successfully sometimes. Any prayers that are uttered in public are usually not mentioning Jesus and not uttered in Jesus' name. Our nation has changed from a clearly Christian nation where Christ was dominant into a mushy nation where every idea and philosophy and religion is to be treated equally with all the others so that we don't even have Jesus Christ as our model anymore as a nation. Of course, we know that ISIS tortures and beheads Christians in other countries, and don't be surprised if it happens in the United States, and maybe it has, I don't know. In Matthew 24, 9, Jesus said, You will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. He was speaking to his close disciples. But in a very real way, I hope and pray and think that we are his close disciples today. Much of this has developed in my lifetime of 28 years. I mean, of 82 years. Almost 82. It's hard for me to believe that I and others have allowed all this to happen. At the rate our nation world is going, either I or my children will probably be physically persecuted for believing in Jesus. What is the deal? Why do people persecute Christians? What is wrong with us that they don't like us? What is so terrible about Jesus? Nothing is terrible about Jesus. Everything is good. But Satan does his work in the minds and hearts of people who are not committed to Jesus so that they are not only uncommitted to Jesus, but they become anti-Christians. It's a sad, sad state of affairs, but we should not be so surprised. 2 Timothy 3, 1-5 says, Understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, 
swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. <laughs> That's quite a list. That is really quite a list. And that's the way it's turning out. And then Peter himself in 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4, writes, Knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Hmm. I marvel at what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 12 and 13. Speaking of the last days, he said, If those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Wow. And this uh, second translation I got here called the message, if you wanted to call the translation, Ends the passage with these words, stay with it. That's what God requires. Stay with it to the end. You won't be sorry and you will be saved. That's what I've titled this sermon, stay with it. It's going to very likely cost us a lot more than it has already cost us to stay with it. But stay with it. You won't be sorry and you will be saved. Stay with it. It's worth it. It's more than worth it. Stay with the gospel. Stay with the truth. Stay with Jesus. As Peter writes in 1 Peter 4.13, Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Oh, that's, that's kind of a toughie. For a lot of people. It wasn't for the apostles. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy. To be beat up. For Jesus. But so that you may be overjoyed. The Bible says. When his glory is revealed. And in 2 Peter. Back to Peter here. 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 to 11. It tells the end. Of those who persecute you. Because you are a Christian. You've always, well, I've always wondered, I'd like to get even with him. If I'd have been Jesus on the cross, I might have zapped a whole bunch of people. I like to get even. But in 2 Peter 2, 4 to 11, it tells, Peter explains that God punished the rebellious angels. And sent them to hell. And in that same passage it tells that God spared Noah and his family who were righteous. But totally destroyed those who teased him and picked on him. And God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah but saved Lot out of the destruction. And then Peter says in verse 9 of 2 Peter 2, If this is so, if it's so about the angels, God took care of them, casting them into hell. If this is so, if this is so that the people who tease Noah drown, if it is so that the people who were sinful against Lot were killed, but God was saved, if this is so, the Bible says, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. Wow. God will take care of you and he will get even with the people who persecute you. And he writes in verse 13 of... 2 Peter 2, they will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. The Bible says that God says, vengeance is mine. And 
somebody like me who kind of feels like if this guy teases this guy and hurts him, he ought to get hurt the same way somehow. Well, God's going to take care of it. Pay him back with harm for the harm they have done. We don't even have to waste our time trying to get even with them. God is going to do it for us. And he'll do it right. So, here we are. We have seen that Peter preached to them the gospel in one long sentence. And we have seen that he both warned and encouraged them regarding persecution and suffering. Even clearly explaining the purpose of their suffering. We read those verses and we tend to read the Bible and we read those verses that tell why they were suffering. And then we close the Bible and we say, I wonder why Christians suffer so much. And we didn't pay attention. Now beginning with verse 8 of 1 Peter chapter 1. He writes words to his audience that are encouraging and ought to make them feel good. And as far as I'm concerned, it ought to make you feel good. You want to feel good? Especially after I've been talking about all this negative stuff. Would you like to feel better? Well then, pay attention, okay? Here we go. Verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now those words are too good and too sweet to read just once. I'm going to read him again, and this time, pay better attention. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I hope you understand these words are to you, people who are in this building in Mound City, Missouri, on this date, what is this, September 1st of 2019. It's for you. Amen. You have not seen him, but you love him. You do not see him now, but you believe in him. And you're filled with glorious joy. You are receiving the goal of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. These words written almost 2,000 years ago are for you. For you and everyone who receives the gospel and endures suffering with faithfulness. Those encouraging words speak of love. And you good people here in Mound City have demonstrated Christian love beautifully, to me at least, and I know to many other people. And you haven't seen him. I haven't either. But we all love him. And you love one another. And that marks the Christian. The Bible says so. Everyone knows that you are his disciples because of your love. Those encouraging words speak of faith. And you have that faith. And you've exhibited it time and again to me and many others. And you are receiving the goal of your faith. What is the goal of your faith? Salvation. We're not made to live here. We were, we're made to live eternally. We were originally made to not die. We were originally made to enjoy what we will be able to enjoy in heaven. You have the love that Jesus commanded. 
you believe, stay with it. Stay with the gospel. Stay with the truth. Stay with Jesus. Just three words. Stay with it. Can you say them with me? Stay with it. Thank you.